John Goldsmith was the production designer on Perry Mason. I'm Riley Chow. Now, what do people not know about 1932 and the world of 1933? What do they not know? Yeah, what did they not realize about what was so different back then? Um, I think one of the things that we tried to accent was the fact that the world was changing so radically in terms of how people have lived traditionally through the centuries and how modernity, which we take for granted now, was approaching really fast. So it's a time of tremendous um, change and modernization. And I don't know if you think of that when you think of the 1930s. I don't. I think of uh, the Depression. I think of Prohibition. I think of um, maybe the Olympics, if I were super smart and aware, I learned that, um, things like that. So maybe that's something people might not know. Mm -hmm. And how important is it to be period accurate on a show like this? Because that's something that people kind of say about, you know, uh, great shows all the time is how they're period accurate. But this is kind of getting close to that time where nobody can really verify, nobody really remembers uh, what it was like back then. For me personally, it's absolutely critical that you know what period accurate is. Once you've established that, you can make your choices. And if for a reason like just cinematic interest, um, you choose to not be accurate, that's a choice. But I think to do that without knowing what rules you're breaking or what um, accuracy you're leaving behind, I think that, um, well, everybody's different. But for me, that's not how I would like to work. So we did a tremendous amount of research, which was really fun because there's so much of it. Um, and honestly, to the second point in your question, there are so many people out there in the world now who watch these things with an eye for inaccuracy and then write about it online. <laughs> we jokingly call them Redditors because people on Reddit are doing that and saying that clock wasn't manufactured until 1936. And this episode was set in 1932. And as a joke in the group, not as a joke, it was kind of a truth, but it was funny. We would say, okay, if we're gonna do that because we like the way this looks, or we like this location, even though it wasn't built into until a year after, then I'll take the letter. Like if someone writes, that wasn't an accurate choice. So to answer more broadly your overall question, like there's this range between historical accuracy and what could be sort of cinematic interest. And you put yourself in that range where you want, but I think you have to know what actually was. Um, how's that? Yeah, and just going off that more broadly before we really get into Perry Mason, what about, like, how do you feel about how production design is written about? Um, like, I feel like so often, you know, in a review, it'll say like, oh, there was sumptuous period production design, you know, but I don't know if anybody really knows what that means. Yeah, and, and I don't know, sometimes sumptuous might not be appropriate. It can be really beautiful and it can be really fun to watch, sumptuous. But for me, it has more to do with what design is doing to support the ideas in the story. Um, and those can be about characters, those can be about conversations, those can be about events that are unfolding in these particular locations. But production design choices for me should um, visually support like um, those ideas. So sumptuous can be great and beautiful, but not necessarily appropriate, if that makes sense. So for a writer to talk about design in that way, yeah, for people that just want to watch something beautiful or sumptuous, that's great. But for me, where it's really interesting is in the kind of psychological choices you're making that um, design-wise that come from the scripts themselves. So I don't know if that answers your question, but. I think so. Okay, good. Yeah. Uh, what would you say were the visual rules for Perry Mason for you? The visual rules. Um, so, the visual rules. We had a general idea about color um, that we stuck to as a kind of system. And it also involved degrees of pattern and degrees of texture. There were these ideas that much of our story was set in town, in Los Angeles, downtown, but other parts were set further afield, sometimes way out, like Mason's farmhouse or the country where the Gerard farmhouse was, or Salinas, where the workers were in the back of the truck and you went to visit his ex-wife and his son. So in those places, we wanted 
the colors to be more muted and the patterns to be more finely scaled. Um, and then when we came into town, the idea was that we would turn the volume up on the scale of the patterns and sort of the jazziness, if you want to call it, of the patterns and also for the color that they would become deeper and richer. Um, so it was a conversation we had with Emma in costumes um, for all the fabric she had to choose. It's something that we looked at very carefully with choices about paint and choices about wallpaper. So in a place like Mason's farmhouse in the living room, that wallpaper was selected very carefully as something that would have been his mother's choice because she decorated the house, he inherited it. Um, and we wanted it to have a vibe in low light of vertical lines that would feel almost prison cell like, but the pattern itself had a very delicate, finely scaled sort of floral pattern to it. And that was very different than say the patterns we chose, I'm trying to think now, um, back that far that were more jazz age. The church meeting hall was one place where we talked about that. Velma's apartment was a place where we talked about that, where the glossiness, sort of the satin textures of her, you know, voluptuous love nest kind of pad would play out and the pink and coral and rose tones of that place would be very different than the country settings that we had. So as far as systems go for how we were working visually, color was a tool we used, pattern was a tool we used, texture was a tool we used. Um, yeah, how's that? Yeah, okay. I feel like more than any other show that I watched this past season, like it looks like no expense was spared on Perry Mason. I'm wondering, was there like a big build for you or was it, or were there kind of several big builds? Um, we were really fortunate. We had a team that was supportive of what the vision for the series was. Um, that being said, there was also a reality to what we had, you know, what people call how much sand was there in the sandbox to play with. And we had to be careful. So I think overall there was something like 130 or 140 locations which was a crazy amount of locations. And we had four stages with, I think, 26 stage builds on them. And some were substantial. I mean, the courtroom was a build and that was a very large space with a lot of materials and a lot of man hours going into its construction. We tried to be careful about being able to adapt certain built sets so that, say the morgue, for example, um, for half the show, it stood as the morgue while we finished all that work. And then at the end of the story where the Radiant Assembly Church has a radio ministry and we needed a radio studio, we converted that space and we hung drapes around the perimeter walls and we built a glass sound booth where a viewing platform had been before. And we tried to be smart, um, strategic in how we could reuse sets that we already had. So yeah, we were really fortunate. Um, we got to do so much. Um, there was also a reality that we had to be careful with and, and we were. Your first show as an art director was John Adams uh, 12 years ago or 13 years ago, I guess at this point. You won an Art Directors Guild Award for it. Uh, that was a massive production, actually uh, reportedly has a bigger budget than Perry Mason does now, even accounting uh, for inflation or without it, I mean. Um, but I wonder in the last 12 years, like going from that HBO period piece to this HBO period piece, if there were like technological uh, advancements that really changed things for you. That's a really interesting question. And I never really thought about it before. I always considered myself like first art directing from no country for old men, which is, you know, a small independent kind of show, but to pair as you've just done one HBO project and then another, um, the scale of each was huge. John Adams had a European component that was probably, if I remember right, a quarter of the schedule maybe, um, where they went back to France for Adams' time there. Um, so there were things about that that pushed the budget, you know, that were different than Perry Mason as a project. As far as technological advances go, um, I wasn't super involved with VFX on John Adams. We had to build um, a giant backlot in a cornfield that we just plowed down and made colonial New York and then turned it over, made it colonial Boston, turned it over, made it colonial Philadelphia. And at the end of all our streets, we built walls of containers that were painted digital green that became the backgrounds for visual effects. Um, on this show, 
like say Angel's Flight, we hung fabric, digital green, for Justin to build in his work afterward. Um, the scale might have been slightly different, the material slightly different. Honestly, I think that's more a question for a visual effects supervisor. Um, I wish I could answer better than that. It's an interesting question. I'm gonna have to think about it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so you won Art Directors Guild Awards for both of those projects. Uh, you were nominated for another one for Perry Mason uh, just recently. And on the website, you know, there's this massive design presentation that goes through all of your work on the show, which is great. Uh, everybody should check out, I guess. Uh, for that one, you were nominated specifically for the third episode, which I imagine is the same one that you're submitting for the Emmys. So I'm wondering uh, how you landed on that one as opposed to others. Uh, and also you can actually submit up to three. So um, when we were asked to submit something, we were told it could only be for one. This is the ADG award. I'm not sure about other awards, um, but for the Art Directors Guild Award, you're only allowed to submit one episode. And for me, what I looked for was the episode, and there was no one episode. There was no clear answer. It could have gone several different directions, but I was looking for the broadest range of work to showcase that would include what for me, were some of my favorite sets. Like the courtroom had to be included. And there were some episodes where there was no courtroom, but there was something fantastic, which wasn't in the episode that ultimately I chose. So it was really just about strategy. I mean, there's so much interesting material in all the episodes, but you said it was three. I honestly can't remember which one we submitted, but if it was three, then that was the one that just provided the greatest range with the sets that I considered like our um, most important sets. Uh, going back through your credits, you came up as a set designer, then assistant art director, art director, now you're a production designer. Uh, and then I was going back further and I see that you actually have two master's degrees from Harvard and Columbia. Uh, for design studies and architecture. I'm wondering if you can just talk about your journey coming up through the industry. Yeah, sure. So I thought I'd want to be an architect when I was younger. And I went to architecture school. And I think it was my second year. Um, I was in New York. And the dean of the school had been friends with the production designer who'd won the Academy Award that year. He had designed Batman. His name was Anton First. So he came and lectured at school. And I saw the lecture and thought the imagery was was beautiful. Um, and when I graduated school, I reached out to him. This was before email. This was before cell phones. You know, um, it was a landline and talked to his assistant who said, you should fly to Los Angeles. And I flew out and met him. Um, and he hired me and I was in LA and it sort of happened that way. About three years after um, my classmates were passing their boards in architecture and I kind of had a moment of this was not my intention. If I want to seek work again in architecture, I really need to know CAD, which had exploded after I'd gotten out of grad school. So I went back to grad school. There's a design school, you know, at Harvard that has um, a one year mid career kind of a program and I wanted to study CAD and I went and did that. Um, I don't know if I'm talking too much, but after all that happened, I'm a big believer in sort of learning the ropes as you move your way up. Um, I think it prepares you much more solidly for when you are um, in a place of leadership and you know what you're doing and you're comfortable and you're able to help other people around you know what it is you're trying to get to. Um, so I'm happy to have come up through set design and art direction and now be here. Um, I hope that's good. Yeah, I mean, this is all about you. So <laughs> uh, what are you working on uh, currently in New Orleans? So it's a super interesting project. It's um, additional photography for something called, it, right now it's untitled. It's an untitled soldier project. Um, and it, it was started, the original photography was in 2019. I wasn't in New Orleans then. Jack Fisk is the designer. Um, and he called when this was coming back for additional photography. And my wife and I are now in New Orleans um, and it's a New Orleans story. And he connected me to the people and it's a fantastic group of people with a beautiful story with super rich ideas um, to support visually. So we're almost done. I think there's another week to go, but it's been a fantastic journey and we'll see what's next. All right, excellent. Well, we look yeah. forward to seeing that. And uh, John, thanks very much for chatting with Gold Derby today. Absolutely. Thanks for everything. Take care.